the Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. I always joke and say we probably thought it was Freud. The Indians have been at it for quite a while. So and they're the ones who developed this brilliant skill called single-pointed concentration. And what they discovered with this skill was their mind, the human mind, to the most sophisticated level that really is that we have not even begun to uh, understand in modern neuroscientific views. And that's not being arrogant. I mean, it's easy enough to prove it if you compare. Because the Buddhist point of mind, the mind, which is radically different, is not the brain. It's not, it's, not, it's not physical. It's not even a function of the brain. But it's got an intimate relationship with the brain. You can't argue with that. So the Buddhist view is the mind is not physical. This is, it's the subjective cognitive process itself. It's our intellect, our neuroses, our psychoses, our love, our compassion, our kindness, our wisdom. And there are these much subtler levels. And in the long term, to cultivate the potential that Buddha has found from his own experience that we've all got, which is to be a Buddha, Buddha, utter eradication of all the neuroses, da, development to perfection of all the goodness, speaking simply. We need to, in order to cultivate that, to get to that level, we need to go to these less subtle levels. We need to cultivate this brilliant thing called single point of concentration, because that's the subtle level of our mind. Only at that level are we that capable. But there's plenty we can do before then. So, so the Buddha, in the Buddhist view of the mind, you've got these, you know, basically the two main, two main categories of states of mind are the neurotic, deluded, delusional, distressing, disturbing afflictions, as they call them in Buddhist psychology. And we all know them. You know, anger, depression, jealousy, attachment, low self-esteem, all these things we are so familiar with. And then the other category are the opposite. Compassion, kindness, love, you know. These words are very simple. And I, I think in modern psychology we don't use such simple words. We talk, we have all these fancy names for our different disturbing states of mind, you know. Usually Latin or Greek for some reason. So the job of the Buddhist is to learn to distinguish between the neuroses and the goodness. It almost seems so simple, but that's the point. And the key interesting point about all the unhappy ones, the neurotic ones, the Buddhist view is that they are in the nature of fear. Fear is their, is their character. So to, to analyze that and, and identify it in the way they describe the mind is very interesting. I mean, just, just think really simply, you know. See some kid shouting, angry, upset, angry. I mean, they're literally having, um, actually they're having quite a mental breakdown. They're completely in a state of panic. Anger really, unless until you really start to harm others, anger is just, you know, this is anxiety, intense, intense anxiety. And anxiety is what? Fear. So, of course, it's hard to understand why, but the Buddhist view explains it very clearly and seems rather abstract to us, but it's totally fascinating. And the main characteristic, then, of love and compassion and kindness and generosity and forgiveness and goodness, from the Buddha's perspective, is that they are not fearful, they are not neurotic, they are not distressing, they are not disturbing. And this is really kind of interesting. We're so familiar with all these unhappy states of mind, and, of course, in our normal view of thinking, normal way of thinking, we don't need psychologists to tell us this. We all believe it totally. They're, they're, they're totally at the core of our being. You know, everyone, everyone recognizes the word anxiety, worry, depression, fear, jealousy, and, you know, panic, arrogance. We recognize these words. We see them in others. And if we look carefully, we're going to see them here. And we know they're horrible. I mean, I always joke and say, you don't, you don't go, oh, I was so anxious yesterday, and it was just great. I mean, it's just absurd. Of course we don't. But we don't think like this. You know, the Buddhist, actually, the Buddhist view, the Buddhist approach, 
it, one way of framing all of Buddhist teachings is in terms of how to get happy and how to stop suffering. It sounds almost rather silly, you know. What do you mean, stop suffering, get happiness? Well, that's what we want, isn't it? No one wants suffering. We all want happiness, well, however we label it, and let's look at Buddha's view. And if you, if you look at it, from the second we wake up in the morning until the time we go to sleep, this is what determines all our choices. What we think will bring us happiness or whatever, fulfillment, and what we and, and avoid, we try to get what we think will cause us happiness and fulfillment, and, and we try to avoid what will get the opposite, you know. We run between these two a thousand times a day. So, of course, the key point for most of us, we never question this. This is, again, key, Buddha's key point, which is so shocking. We think happiness, fulfillment, you know, come from getting certain external conditions, things, people, events. So we pursue them. And then suffering comes from, you know, certain physical things, events, people, so on, and we try to avoid them. It's pretty clear. But the Buddha is saying, yes, the outside world plays a role, but honey child, he says, the main source of your suffering and the main source of your happiness is in here, not there. This is his simple point. It's, it's really not complicated, but it's kind of too shocking to hear it. It seems so kind of straight. It seems absurdly too straightforward. We can't believe it could be that simple. This is the point. Buddha's expertise is the mind. So we've got this, you know, so the psychological model of the mind, for example, is this, there's, there's two categories, the first lot, the neurotic, you know, and the, the neurotic, unhappy, fear-based ones, and they're all necessarily, this is the point about them, and this is where it seems a bit difficult because it seems rather judgmental, it kind, of, kind of feels not fair. They're all totally eye-based. The, the main voices of the neurotic eye. And love and compassion and kindness, etc., wisdom, confidence, they're reasonable states of mind. And they're, and, and many, and they're, and they're kind of expansive, they're not, they're not tight, they're not neurotic, they're not fear-based, they're not constricted, they don't cause pain, they're the source of our happiness. So in a sense, not in a sense, the actual approach in Buddhism to getting happy and stopping suffering is change your mind, work on your mind. So clearly you've got to become familiar with it. You've got to know what's going on in there. And of course that's difficult because we never look. We only notice what's going on in our mind when something really intense is going on. And we can't help but hear the shouting and yelling in our own head. But then it's too late. Damage control is the best you can do. So with the, with the skill that Buddha gives us, even if we don't get fully developed in this genius skill of single-pointed concentration, we just begin to, even if we just begin to utilise it and you know, use it a little bit, what it does is give us the skill, the ability, we do it a little bit every day, it gives us the ability to, to notice what we're thinking and feeling. That's its main skill. The, the long-term goal of this technique, is that, as the term suggests, is literally single-pointed concentration at a level of subtlety, like I mentioned, we don't even posit as existing in neuroscience. It's not being rude, this is the fact. But the, the advantage of developing this skill, even a little, five minutes in the day, start off the day, focusing your mind. What it, it, you might get much concentration, but what you begin to get, what you develop is the ability, because you're trying to, if you try to concentrate for five minutes, and of course you try to do that all the time in all sorts of things, but here you have your eyes closed and you focus on something like your breath going in and out, you're training your mind, not just to be absorbed, absorbed mindlessly in what in what's going on. You know, you start to you're starting to f pay the, you're starting to pay attention to one thing that gives you the ability. It, it causes you to step out of your head a bit, 
and you begin to observe, let's say you're watching the breath, you can't help but notice out of the corner of your eye all the crazy thoughts. They're always there. We don't pay attention until they're screaming. You know. I mean, we'll get annoyed, upset, irritated, frustrated a hundred times a day. And they're just mild anger. But we take them so much for granted, we don't think they're a problem. We think they're normal human behavior, and they are, but they're mild anger. We only notice anger when, it's, when you're screaming. You want to kill your boyfriend. What will I do? I'm so angry. We don't notice when it's a sm small levels of it. We just think, oh, that's just normal, you know. But this is the point. Buddha's saying we've got all these thousands of thoughts in the mind, all of which underpin our emotions. And the skill we're trying to develop is to get to drill down, you know, beneath the physical, beneath the emotional. Emotional is, we say emotion, we say feelings, isn't it? When the body's involved, you know, because it's only then that we notice what's happening in our mind. So Buddha's giving the skills, ability to start to pay attention to the mind before it rises and vomits out the mouth and your body's shaking, you know. It's just too late to notice the mind. But that's our habit. You know, we all know from the second you wake up in the morning until the second you go to sleep, all our attention is, is outside, isn't it? Obvious. Because that's what we think the world is. That's where we think the world is, out there, you know, where this kind of innocent bystander trying to get involved in it, avoiding the ugly stuff and trying to get the nice stuff. That's how we live our lives, isn't it? It's not as this Buddha says we shouldn't do that. It says we're missing a major component, which is our own mind, our own thoughts, feelings, emotions, unconscious, subconscious. And learning to, to, to become, a, learn to identify what's going on in the mind to an extremely sophisticated degree, and then to unpack it, unravel it, and work with it, change it, and navigate it so that you can stay steady in your life and not, not go up and down like yo yo's a thousand times a day. That's Buddha's skill. It's not moralistic, not religious, it's practical psychology. But it's a hard job because we're addicted to the outside world. We're addicted to paying attention to the outside world because they're, the far, they're basically the objects of our senses. And our senses, our body, as Lama Yeshi says, we make the body the boss. We give enormous power to our physical experiences, don't we? Not to our thoughts until they're screaming. So if we, if we hear the Buddha says that get, you know, anger, jealousy, depression, low self-esteem, anxiety, blah, 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 are the source of your suffering, and then he says that love and compassion and kindness and patience and forgiveness are the cause of your happiness, then we, we might hear that and then we start to try to do it and we don't seem to get happiness. I mean, if you're, if you're being angry and you try to control the anger and be patient, you don't feel happy at all. It's the opposite but you've got to start somewhere. And even, even, I mean, this is why it's so, you know, from the Buddhist perspective, it's so important to really study this view of the mind because it's incredibly, I mean, it's, it goes to intense, intricate detail, you know. This, uh, um, the, the, the literature on the mind is vast. This is coming back from the, before the Indian, I mean, the Indians before the Buddha. They're the ones who, who first came up with this way of the mind working. Buddha didn't throw that out. He went forward in his own direction and all this view of Buddhas is very similar to what these Indians discovered by looking inside. And I think in our culture that's, you know, what we, what we call psychology is not the lowest on the totem pole of the sciences because we don't trust the subjective, you know. We can see it and touch it and touch it and smell it, we trust it more. But the Buddha's opposite. The mind is the main thing. So the, the thing that so the, the the thing that's the thing that Buddha is saying this is what's hard to see, but let's look at this. And when we say emotions, when we say emotions, when we say feelings, 
it's hard to it's hard to really you know I mean it's so vivid for us because it's when the body is so involved that we notice them we talk about feeling them in our body yeah body absolutely is an indicator but I mean what we have to learn to do is that this is to go beneath that and to try to identify these different neuroses or even the positive qualities because the Buddha is saying at a much subtler level that all those emotions are underpinned by conceptual stories. It's like these thoughts, thousands of thoughts going on and on and on and they're all, and they're all basically, one way of putting it, they're basically viewpoints, they're basically opinions, like a really nice way of looking at this. Is we got you see when the, when you're also studying in Buddhist psychology you study the Buddhist um, you see you study the epistemological model of the mind which is the way the mind functions which is totally fascinating. I'm sure modern I mean scientists would be totally fascinated to study it. The way the mind works, but of course Buddha's not describing the brain; he's describing the actual cognitive process itself, which is quite subtle. It's extraordinary. So the the, the epistemological model describes how we've got one simple way describes how we've got two ways that our mind functions one is sensory consciousness eye consciousness ear consciousness nose consciousness etc the word consciousness and mind are used pretty much synonymously just in different contexts that's all So you've got an, a, a cognition of your eye consciousness. Remember that my consciousness, mind, are not physical. So it's that part of your mind that functions through the medium of the eyeball, the nerves all working, the eyelid open, you know, blah, blah. And you have a cognition, let's say, of something. So you would cognize. And so it only, an, an eye consciousness can only cognize the senses are very limited in their capacity for cognition, according to this model. And I consciousness cognizes only two things, shape and color. That's it. So forget the other senses, but just this alone. It's so vivid, isn't it? If, we, if we're not blind, we open our eyes in the morning and turn the light on, the first thing that is occurring to us is all these shapes and colors. Literally, conscious, eye consciousness is only capable of cognizing shape and color. So it's really obvious. You have to then ask the question when you open your eyes and you see blue, and then you say blue curtain, or you see red, and you say a red cup. If eye consciousness can only cognize color, then what part of your mind is cognizing curtain? cup and the whole world if you think about it forget the other senses is is our objects of eye consciousness so in that sense literally you're seeing only shape and color this is quite shocking because we will, what we will say is oh look at that ugly red cup look at that beautiful man look at that lovely rainbow we'll say but eye consciousness is not capable of that. This is not meant to be, so this is really quite profound, actually. If we start to realize this, it's very sobering. So then which part of our mind cognizes beautiful, rainbow, cup, curtain, person, and everything else? Well, that's your mental consciousness. That's where the workshop is, as Lover's Opus says. That's where all your thousands of memories and thoughts and opinions and viewpoints are stored so what happens is i'm not kidding is the millisecond my eyes go to the sea black and of course even my eye consciousness is not even capable of saying black because that's a concept that's a function of mental consciousness it just merely cognizes black it's limited so then Quicker than Google, not kidding, the millisecond my eye consciousness goes there, my mental consciousness is accessed, and within a second up comes, you know, a microphone. 
That's a Mac computer, cord, table, and the billion other things that we have learned as we got, got you know, as we learned as a little girl, learn to identify and then store in our memory. And of course, along with those bare bones facts, relative conventions, microphone, table, computer. I mean, if you call that an elephant and that a cup, you'd be in trouble, just conventionally. But then you've got the, and, the, and, the, and the, most of it is opinions, viewpoints, ugly person, beautiful sound. And if you analyze it, and this fits with the Buddhist model, there are three types of opinions. The first lot are the neurotic ones. So anger, yes, there's a feeling there. You feel it in your body. But if you listen carefully when you pay attention to your mind and you practice meditation and you start to listen, you, you hear what anger is saying. It's a viewpoint. Look at that ugly person. How disgusting that Mr. Trump is. Who does she think she is? Look at those ugly people. How dare they do that? This is a vivid series of conceptual thoughts called angry thoughts called the concept of anger that paints a picture of that person. So we're living in opinions, conceptual stories. They dominate our lives. So we don't then we don't go, well that's a you know, that's we don't go there's black and then we go, well now we call it a you know, we just instantaneously go to it. Or I'll hear one note of a trumpet, you know, I'll go, wow, Miles Davis, because I'm familiar with Miles Davis and like Miles Davis's sound. One note and I say, wow, Miles Davis. So we, from the second we wake up and, we, we, and, and whatever, we're we, we cognizing the external phenomena, sound, bare sound, bare shapes and colors, bare taste, but we then have these endless opinions. Our access, our mental consciousness runs the show. That's where the workshop is. All these opinions. And even to the subtler level, comp com computer, table, microphone. There's a valid co conventional, there's a conventional validity to them. But even they finally are opinions but that we agree upon. It's conventional means that. So we should be ashamed, we should be embarrassed. But we, and this is, but this is, a, and this is a tragedy. If I just see the face, you know, of my ex-boyfriend who did, in fact, harm me, that's a conventional fact. Everyone saw it. He cheated on me, let's say. Because I have anger in my mind, the way his face will appear to me, that shape and colour, will appear, as Lama Zopa says, appear back to me, is as ugly. And it's distressing. My mind freaks out. <clears throat> so, of course, we think his face and his actions are the cause of this pain, this anger. Well, the Buddha would say, yes, they are a cause, but they're only secondary, Rabina. They're only catalysts. This is the shocking part, that the anger in my mind is the main source of my suffering. The anger in my mind is the main source. This is so shocking to us, we almost can't hear it. So don't believe him. He might be speaking a load of rubbish. Check him out. He says, Buddha says, don't believe a single word I'm telling you. So, what, so the point is, all these neurotic states of mind, because they're all based on this I, the root delusion, the key function of all these neuroses, all these delusions, and that word delusion is very delicious, it implies exactly their character, these conceptual stories, that are rooted in the emotions we feel, when they're angry emotions, jealous emotions, ang anxious emotions, you understand? That they are distorted, they're not valid cognitions. A valid cognition for the Buddha is not some moralistic one, it's just, is it true or not? We've got conventional truth and ultimate. We'll keep it to the conventional. We all have agreed that's called a microphone. We've all agreed that's called a computer. That's how we communicate. We agree upon things, you know. There's no absolute computer. There's no absolute microphone. We agree, conventionally, that's called a computer. That's how we communicate, you know. So it's helpful if I speak and say, I have a computer on my desk. It's helpful when you hear those words, you go, oh, phew, she's speaking the truth, you know. That's called conventional truth. So there's a, va a validity to the statement, that's a table, that's a computer. 
that he is ugly because he hurt me. I hate him. Buddha would say they're not valid cognitions. Not that he didn't hurt you. He did. That's a, that's a conventional truth. You saw, you all saw, he cheated on me. So you can all prove that is true conventionally. But what we find almost impossible is to distinguish that fact from the anger. So we assume, even forget the boyfriend cheating on you, just stubbing your toe. You stub your toe. So what arises? There's different kinds of experiences we have. And there's, in, the, in one cat, there's three categories of states of mind. The negative, neurotic, deluded, ridiculous ones, I-based ones, fear-based ones, the valid, reasonable, good, positive, useful ones, beneficial ones, productive ones, the source of happiness. And then the third lot are like the mechanics of the mind. And in that category, which is odd sounding, there's one called feeling. Not like we call emotion, but happy feeling, unhappy feeling, or neutral feeling. Well, forget the neutral. There's either pleasant feeling, happy feeling, very happy feeling, very pleasant feeling, pleasure, happiness. They're all words referring to a happy feeling. Then you've got unhappy feeling, intense suffering feeling, unbearable, dis, you know, un, unpleasant feeling. So that's true. We have those sensory and mental. Sensory and mental. The sensory are clear. You stub your toe. It hurts. There's a pain. It's called unpleasant feeling. A sensory feeling of, of, of lack of, of, of hurt. So what happens normally, this, what happens is then we get angry. What, why are you angry, Rubina? I just stubbed my toe. We don't ever question that there are two events. There's two separate events there. One is an unpleasant feeling, but we assume it's natural, I will get angry. So we, don't, we just assume it's, well, that's, that's the cause of my anger. I've got no choice. I have to be angry. What can I do? But Buddha, not true at all. And we can, we can, we can, you know, Buddha didn't invent this, he just identified it. So all this is rooted, anger is rooted in a subtler, of, of these neurotic states of mind, fear-based, the, the, the main voice of ego, and it's called attachment. So attachment is this primordial, I always say it's multifaceted, but first of all, this primordial you know, energy of not having enough, deep feeling of dissatisfaction. And so then it leads to emotional hunger. I'm missing something. Dissatisfied means missing something. So if you're missing something, you're hungry for something. Something's missing, so you're looking. So the very first level you look is the object of the senses. They're very vivid. But we attach them not just to the object of the senses. That's pretty clear. So because this attachment runs the show, it's the default mode inside us, all of us, join the universe here. If you're a normal person, you have this masses of attachment. Depending on your personality, you might have less you practice more perhaps in a past life and you come into this life more fulfilled, more content, less dissatisfied. So dissatisfaction is constantly there, so then emotional hunger is constantly there. And what emotional hunger wants is pleasant feelings. It wants pleasant feelings. So the millisecond you stub your toe, which is an unpleasant feeling, the response to attachment when it doesn't get what it wants is anger. So it's ugly event, it's ugly. Boyfriend is ugly, horrible, he's the cause of my suffering. So we've got to read all this approach, it demands, from the Buddhist perspective, it demands a lot of clarity and precision in first analyzing, in first identifying these different states of mind and the ways, the different ways the mind functions. Quite precise then you can start to use all this knowledge to unpack and unravel your own experiences second by second by second and start to be in charge of them. That's being a Buddhist, really. It's the job. But it's interesting. So let's try to find, let's try to analyze why fear is the flavor the nature, the energy of the unhappy ones. Why? It's very, it seems quite odd 
to hear it like this because this is not how we think. What is saying the key function, the key characteristic, the two main characteristics of the, of the neurotic states of mind, the unhappy states of mind? Two main characteristics. One is, and these words, are, these, and this is indicated by these two, two of the many synonyms for these afflictions as they're referred to in the typical Tibetan and Sanskrit literature, mental afflictions. So one of those, that word affliction, we could call it a disturbing state of mind. So that's pretty clear. Disturbing, you're very disturbed when you're angry, jealous, depressed, low self-esteem, anxious. You know, we know that, it's very clear you're disturbed. And again, remember, we think it's the, anyway, well, it's a disturbing emotion. It's very clear, these afflictions. But the other one is the one that's fascinating. It's harder to identify. And that's indicated by this word, delusion. So anger is a deluded, a deluded state of mind. Attachment is a deluded state of mind. Jealousy is a deluded state of mind or a delusion. So that means it's literal. It's very literal. It's not some kind of fancy idea. It's very literal. Speaking very simply, if I say one plus one is three, I mean, you wouldn't say it was a delusion because it sounds extreme. We think delusional is when you're living in la-la land and you're kind of completely out of your brain. I mean, seriously deluded. But the Buddha would say we are all deluded. It's a question of degree. And they're deluded insofar as we have attachment, anger, jealousy, and depression. They are disturbing, but the real function, once we get to see that they're conceptual stories, is that they are deluded concepts, meaning they're not a valid cognition. They're not a valid statement about something. It's like saying one plus one is three. Okay, there's no emotion involved in that, but we would say that's not a valid cognition. It's not a valid statement. It's not a valid concept. Because we have decided conventionally among us, and that's what conventional reality means, it's by agreement. We've come up with, all these clever people have come up with what's called mathematics. We all learn it, and we all agree. We shake hands. Yes, one plus one is two. We agree upon these things, and that's how we live our lives, on these really complicated, elaborate, conventional realities. How a computer works, and what you type, and there's A, and a cup, and a table. So that's what truthful conventions, they are valid conventionally. And we all learn to learn, we learn them, and then we can agree, and so then we can communicate. They are valid cognitions conventionally. Well, this is what's fascinating. Anger is also a concept. Like, look, he's ugly. Look what he did to me. He is the cause of all my suffering. Or how dare you do that to me? I don't deserve it. That statement for the Buddha is riddled with misconceptions. So I've got to unpack it. It's quite, it's quite subtle, quite fascinating. How is that a misconception, we'll say? My boyfriend did cheat me. No one's arguing with that fact. But what anger is, what attachment is, what jealousy is, what low self-esteem, arrogance, you name it, any one of these unhappy, delusional, disturbing, distressing, neurotic states of mind is they are disturbing because they're delusional, because they're misconceptions. The trouble is we've had these misconceptions for, Buddha would say, countless lifetimes. I mean, that's pretty deep. You come into this life fully programmed with all our delusions. And because they're so habitual, my mother didn't have to teach me to be angry. I had it down, I promise you. Do you understand my point, you know? These are the things we say are natural. Or you're just born this way. Oh, it's natural. Of course it's natural. But we mean by natural that you'd be wacko and unnatural if you didn't have it. But this is what Buddha is saying. We can learn to get rid of it. And why we can change our mind, why we can get rid of angry concepts, which are, root, which are what the, emotionals of, the emotion of anger is rooted in, 
this misconception is because they are misconceptions. So why fear? Well, it's a bit like, you know, you've believed for so long that your $50 note is 500. You just believed it totally. And you even see 500. And you're addicted to this. So every time you see it, you get excited. And you can't wait to spend your 500 and you anticipate the $500 worth. But of course, what will be the result if you have this belief, this over-exaggerated, over-excited, distorted, exaggerated view of that thing, then the only, op the only choice is that you will be bitterly disappointed. So attachment is over, over exaggerates the deliciousness of things. Aversion or anger over exaggerates the ugliness of things. And all the delusions, and Buddha talks about, we all hear about these 84,000 neurotic states of mind, and they all come down, they all subsume to the three poisons. They're all misconceptions. But they're totally programmed, because when Buddha says we've been practicing them for countless lifetimes. That's what he says, you know. So they're totally natural to us. And because we've practiced attachment and anger and jealousy and whatever the, our habits are for so long, that's why they are so powerful and emotional. And we feel we have, what, you know, like a joke to say that they're rooted in being concepts, like a joke to say that. Because, uh, you know, it's like, as, as Lama Zopa says, if the attachment's strong, in most of us, it's normal, then because you feel you're missing something, which is what its energy is, missing something, I'm dissatisfied, then naturally you, the next level of it is emotional hunger to look for something automatically out there, the object of the senses is the first level. And then based on that attachment and based on your connection with certain things due to karma, then cake or certain bodies or music or whatever it might be will be what you will run towards. And then your attachment exaggerates the beauty of those things, exaggerates the power, their power to make you happy once you get contact with them. It's like layers and layers and layers of literally misconceptions, but completely we're programmed with them. So it's enormously hard to unpack all this and see it, observe it. So why they're rooted in being, in, in rooted in fear is because they're not valid. So naturally, every, if you've been spending, if you've been having fifty dollars and you keep spending and expecting five hundred and get disappointed, but do it again the next day, do it again the next day, do it again again. So what are you going to build up? This intense habit of anticipation and of fear and panic because you know from countless past lives it hasn't worked, but you forget that you just go, you just go to program and do it again, and yet again you get disappointed, yet again you go crashing down to despair because it didn't work. I mean, look at our attachment, up and down like yo-yos. Totally programmed with attachment. Yesterday we ate that cake. We saw the cake. The stomach was empty. We were thinking, what's missing? Oh, cake, so delicious. And you run towards it, desperate because you're hungry. You're emotionally hungry. You're missing something. So you're frantically trying to find that thing. So the cake appears. And then already it's, it's exaggerating in your mind already the power of the cake. This enormous relief. God, I'll get the cake. The cake will do it. And then when you see the cake, the colour and shape are there, but what you don't see, you don't see shape and colour. You don't see a brown triangle. Look at the picture you paint. Attachment paints it all automatically. And, then, and this is the tragedy. We believe, it's like seeing 50 but seeing 500. We believe it is that delicious divine thing. And the anticipation is so intense of the pleasure that will come. And the pleasure, and this is the point, even more tricky, the pleasure does come. But what happens? This is a tragedy. Pleasure does come. Pleasant feeling does come. But what happens? Attachment has been saying, get the cake, get the cake, come on, then pleasure will come, then pleasure will come. And, you, and the attachment drives you to get the cake and drives you to have the cake and puts the thing on, gets the knife, cuts it, puts the thing on a fork, puts it in the mouth. Attachment saying, put it in the mouth, put it in the mouth. And you get it in the mouth and attachment says, sorry, not enough, have another piece. Not satisfied yet. So then you want to vomit after four pieces. We know this. It's just too painful to hear it because it's all programmed. We are programmed like this because of practice. Don't blame your mother. It's the practice, Buddha says, in countless lifetimes. We're completely programmed in believing these lies.
So of course you're living in fear. We live in con we're living in constant fear. So we just call it panic, call it anxiety. And this is the point. Cause attachment so hungry to get the nice thing, and I don't mean just nice night cakes, like nice cakes and nice bodies and nice music. No, nice feelings second by second. And the second you contact a thing like the stub toe, an unpleasant feeling comes. You know, you have a panic attack. It's called anger. You freak out because attachment just didn't get what it wanted. It got pain. It it got it had a panic attack. How dare that happen? Because we can't stand unpleasant. Attachment is a junkie that just can't cope with anything that isn't nice, which means anything that I don't want. So we have a panic attack a thousand times a day. Fear. As soon as you start to build up this fear of that thing that you, you know, the, the ugly experience you had when you were 17, we all call it, what do we call it, PTSD or whatever, that's just because you haven't dealt with it. You buried it away, it was so fearful and horrible, or even when you're six and seven, not to mention 17 or whatever, so you buried it away and never looked at it. So every time you remember that person, you, it, 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 it brings up acute stress, which is another word for anxiety, because you can't cope with it, so you bury it away. I mean, we've all got PTSD, we're all neurotic, we're all full of stress because we haven't coped with, we don't know how to cope with the things that attachment doesn't want. So we bury them or blame. Fear is, a, is the nature of all the neuroses. So you can say when you've eventually got to the level of getting, you know, working on your mind, reading, getting rid of even to a radical degree, forget totally, Attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, you learn, you navigate your mind, you steadily practice, 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 then eventually you will be beyond fear. Finally, when you realize emptiness, there will be no fear because now you are in touch with what is real. There are no mistakes left, no invalid cognitions, no fantasies, no, mis no, no projections, no misconceptions. Literally, your mind is now is in sync with how things exist. Literally, they say there is no longer any fear. We almost can't even hear that. It just seems too weird, you know? So one of the practices, I mean, first we have to see the mind. First, if you like Buddhism, you better study it, you know? what Buddha's talking about. We all say we know what attachment is, we know what anger is. Yeah, some rough physical feeling, but you've got to be more analytical and more precise. You have to be accurate about your mind. The level of clarity and precision and depth of analysis that we know you need if you want to play, play Bach, make a cake, is the same level of clarity, precision and depth of analysis that you need to really unpack and unravel your mind. To, to develop your marvelous potential. So one of the approaches, of course, given that we can't guarantee you'll meet only what attachment wants, then you have to learn to be, to be brave, to be not fearful in the face of the things your attachment can't cope with like ugly ex-boyfriends, the bad weather, stubbing your toe, Mr. Trump or whoever you don't like. You know, I mean, you can say Mr. Trump's behaving very, very nicely. Have you noticed? In all the news, not a word, he's not saying a bad word. You've got to admire the man. He just doesn't give up. You've got to admire his constant enthusiasm. He's abused, attacked, insulted, sued by everybody in each state. It's just, it's just, I mean, you've got to admire the man. I can't get over his incredible, whatever you want to call it, you know. It's beyond, most people, as soon as they're accused of anything, they snuck off looking completely ashamed, you know. He couldn't care. I mean, you've got to admire that quality. Most people have a mental breakdown when they're accused of anything. You've got to admire the man. He's just something beyond belief. Are we communicating? Nobody can believe he's like that. You can't believe, and there he is, all the people supporting him because they've got no choice. No one else, I mean, that poor, what's her name in Texas, forget it, you know, Florida, wherever it was. That, what's her name, that, that Indian woman, you know? I mean, forget it. It's, it's just mind boggling. You can't get over it, you know? Anyway, so ask me some questions now, people. Come on. 
Mm. Oh, do I? Yep. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hello. Okay, so I have a question about. Um, so if it's a delusion to blame external factors for my Get anger. Get to the mic, sweetheart. If it's a delusion to blame external factors for my anger and depression and anxiety and whatever, then is it also a delusion to take full responsibility for everything bad that happens? Because I kind of like, and then I beat myself up. You mean sort of go to the other extreme? No, no, no. Yes. No, no, no. Okay, first of all, I understand you, Olga, it's good. So the, the, first of all, the word here I'm using, delusion, is very specifically referring to the, to the, to the, to the anger, attachment, jealousy the, itself. You can definitely say it's also delusional to blame because it's not accurate. So, but, so the, okay, when we understand that the key energy of the unhappy ones is that they're quite literally disturbing and distorted and exaggerated. So you could say you're over-exaggerating when you say, you know, the boyfriend is the cause of all my suffering, which is what we believe. But the other extreme, which is also delusional, is, well, okay, if the boyfriend's not all the blame, I must be the blame, kill myself. Because, it, <laughs> so, so there's a question of saying, so you almost could say it this way, the, de the deluded emotions have this distorted, exaggerated, painful feeling. But then you could almost say there's, there's, a, there's a positive state of mind that you could, you could confuse them for. So for example, humility is a really good positive quality. It's a per and you could argue that a person who's humble is very content with themselves. So they're able to praise other people very easily and they're very relaxed. But we would confuse humility with low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So low self-esteem, again, is, 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 a, is in the delusion category. Humility is in the positive category, but we mix them. So a person who's arrogant, that's deluded. That's very fearful, very neurotic. The person's obsessed with who they think they are. They exaggerate their qualities and they're fancy for people to like them. But a person who's confident could might not be, could be just self-confident, they would also be humble. The, the arrogant person would flip over into low self-esteem. So the character of all the neuroses is disturbing and distressing and they all exaggerate. So pride exaggerates your importance, low self-esteem exaggerates your unimportance. They're, they're not as, so they are indeed the opposite, but they're very linked. So we've got, it's much, much more nuanced than that. So a virtuous state of mind, a positive state of mind, if you're taking the Buddhist view, let's say, and you hear how we blame the external, meaning I'm an innocent victim, I know I don't play any role at all. That, from the wisdom point of view in Buddhism, is just, is insane. Everything is dependent arising. Everybody, there's some role in it all. You know, well, like I said, you and I are playing tennis. We're both doing something. You can't say it's all you and I'm this innocent victim. I'm hitting the ball as well. So when you have a virtuous or wise approach, you do factor yourself in and know that you did this and you did that. When if you're being courageous, you see lot. You try to see logically what Buddha means by your the main cause of your suffering is your own mind, and the main cause of your happiness is your mind. That doesn't contradict that your boyfriend doesn't play a role. It doesn't contradict that you didn't get pain in your toe. So it's a very precise point. So the virtues are comfortable, courageous, cautious, um, reasonable, valid, appropriate. But they're difficult initially, but they're eventually the source of happiness because they're valid. But the delusions are not valid. They're neurotic and disturbing and eye-based and distressing and self-pity and, you know, poor me. Right. They've got a very distinct different character. One more question. Is that okay? Do you get the point? So it demands a almost. lot of looking to <laughs> see the difference. It's almost impossible initially, for example, to distinguish between humility, you know, oh, I'm trying to be humble, you say. But if we, if we see it in the wrong way, we end up becoming low self-esteem. Oh, I'm trying to be humble. You're just becoming, oh, I'm nothing. It's really hard because it's very nuanced, the difference in our experience. The difference is hard to identify. So one indication of if it's neurotic is if it's a very vivid feeling of I. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. It's hard. That means we've got to have a daily practice. Otherwise, it's impossible to see our mind properly. Do you understand? That makes sense. Good yeah. Feeling. Someone else? Anybody online got a question? Mm. Okay, we've got here. Eileen has a question. 
Go Arlene, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do I have to put her up here or you got her? Do Hello? I have to put the, my, my volume up here or not? Okay. Go Eileen, I'm hearing you. Yes, thank you, Rabina. So I often think, well, what would it mean to be in sync with the way things really are? Which one is it? That's the one that turns the volume on permanent. Look, it's permanently off. Okay, good. Okay, darling, go. Talk to me. So, so. Oh, there's a lot. Oh, there it goes. Um, so what would it mean to really be in sync with the way things really are? See, that's another one. I, I can't. It means, first of all, internally, even real, not even before you realize emptiness, forget that you haven't even, not even get to the point where you realize emptiness, which is a big milestone, okay, where you really have cut the root of the delusions and you can really say there you'll be in sync with reality, but even just relatively reasonably in sync with reality, because it's a process, Eileen, one day to the next. So the more you, the more you give up, you become less emotionally hungry, therefore less attached, therefore less angry, just right there. These two, which are the source of all the other dramas, there's a very intimate relationship between these different states of mind. If you've got less attachment, means you're more content internally, genuinely content, then you'd be less upset or angry when bad things happen. So you'd still see it's a bad thing. You'll mm -hmm. see the boyfriend cheated on you. You'll see you stubbed your toe. You'll see the crazy politician, but you won't have a mental breakdown. So you'll, be, you'll see it for what it is, a lousy politician, and that can be objectively a fact, I mean. You can see you stubbed your toe. You can see the boyfriend cheated on you. They are facts, but mm -hmm. you'd, you'd be able to identify the facts. You wouldn't be like having a conspiracy theory because all the delusions are like conspiracy theories. And you'd be more emotionally stable, therefore more content, more fulfilled, more courageous, more compassionate, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Yes? Okay, good enough. Thank you. I mean, does not that sound nice? Is this not what we want? What we want, you know? It's hard work. Yep. Yeah, the microphone back here, please. Yes. Thanks. Can you give um, some practical approaches for actually doing this? Like, it, it makes sense. Because right? of the mic, sweetheart. Can, can you talk about a practical practice for actually doing this? It makes sense, but then... We... To get to see the mind. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, the, yes, the, the methodology is, first of all, I mean, it's a bit like I'm just describing, you know, music here. So you got to start, you got to start at the basics. You got to get, you got to, so okay, here that means, um, the way I'm talking, the intricate way I'm talking about the mind using the Buddhist model, you've got, to, you've got to learn these words. You have to learn these words. You have to learn Buddha's definition of attachment. What is anger? What is attachment? What is jealousy? What is love? What is compassion? What is a valid cognition? It's a language in this system. Do you understand? So it's like if you're teaching to me about computers and you will use all this foreign language as far as I'm concerned about IT, I'm lost. So you've got to learn the words, which means ideally the main components to start this process would be you start with um, learning this model of the mind. Now, many Buddhists don't even do that. I mean, we like the Buddhist teachings, but okay, so that's an ideal scenario. And then at the same time, how you apply that in daily life, because that's how you, you apply the music by having a piano, but you've got to know the theory. So the same here, you learn the theory. This is ideal, typical way of learning. And then you apply it in your own mind and an ideal starting point. And this is where mostly in the world people do start and don't learn the theories. They learn to get some kind of practical concentration meditation technique going every day. So that just alone is such a sophisticated thing, but you can start somewhere. You start, and of course we all know discipline helps. You don't just study the music once every couple of weeks and never go in, you know, you gotta do it every day. So you'd have a simple technique where you'd use such as something like the breath as your object, and then you pr learn the practical technique. And there's particular instructions, you know, we can just cross our fingers, but it's good to learn it from somebody who knows what they're talking about. 
follow the instructions, you'd start with five minutes a day where you just learn to sit and then you decide you're going to pay attention to that particular thing, which is the, called the breath. And then you learn to know how to work with that because the mind won't stay on the breath for more than three seconds, I promise, because we're so familiar with going all over the place. So you learn this practical technique where you begin to train your mind to pay attention on one thing. So you won't get, you won't get much concentration. That's going to come slowly. But the advantage of that is that you bring that skill to bear in your daily life. So when you get off your cushion and go to the kitchen and your partner's there, and I was the dumbest example, slurping their coffee yet again, whereas normally you just blurt out, oh, darling, you know I don't like slurping and try to say it in a loving way. But this time you catch the annoyance arising before it vomits out the mouth. Are we communicating? This is the practical application of day to day of what I'm talking about in this room. And it's slowly, slowly, step by step. So the ability to do this job, like I just said to her, demands incredible concentration. I mean, incredible, not the levels of concentration that you can get, which are very subtle, but even some relative concentration, some relative ability to stay focused, and then the will to use that to then every day in your daily life, not just be aware of the boyfriend drinking the, drinking, slurping the coffee and the, and, and the traffic being bad and all good things, you also are paying attention to your thoughts. And you begin to see them and hear them more and more clearly every day, more and more quickly. And there are a thousand thoughts a second. Buddha agrees with the, the modern psychological view. So it's a, it's a difficult job, but that's the key to success. You with me? That's the principle. You with me? That's the answer. Then it's a question of degree, question of practice. There are a million other things as well, but that's the essence of it. That's good? Happy with that? Good? Okay. It's the hardest job we'll ever do because the last thing we want to do is change our mind. What do you mean change my mind? It's him who should change, you know? It's automatic. Because is it, that's when we start to get very familiar with these unhappy emotions. This, this is not, it kind of seems kind of cruel, but when we get caught up in the attachment and anger and, he, and the self-pity and the jealousy and the depression, you can hear how it's this hopeless, poor, I can't do anything, it's impossible, poor me, the world happens to me. I mean, I'm being mean, it's hard to see it ourselves, we all know people like that. And you can see that the people who are very angry, very jealous, very depressed, not being rude, are really like caught up in completely obsessed with themselves and can't see past their own nose. You with me here? You know what I'm saying, people. So you can see it. And that's how we all like. We're all like that. And it doesn't mean bad things don't happen. Terrible things happen on this planet. And this is the point here. It's not a question of blaming us. We hear this as blame. It's not just trying to locate the problem. Because if you know, and we can see the suffering on this planet is unbelievable. The terrible things people do to each other is unbelievable. So then, when we can, when we get into the situations, like you know, like you know, Maureen deals with people in prison, like in nightmarish environments for sixty-five years because of one little blink they did 40, 65 years ago. I mean, I know people in prison too. These nightmarish environments where you can't even imagine you can stay sane. The thing all these people are good at is learning to look on their mind because they know they can't change the outside world. So this is a skill that we can learn to have the courage to develop, you know. If, and they're saying in Buddhism, if you can change something, well, honey, please change it. But what if you can't? That's where we go mad. That's the point at which we go mad. Because we really don't, be we don't believe we can change, but we don't think I should change. I'm allowed to be angry. Look what they are doing to me. This is the nightmare that is so much pain, you know. It's understandable because we don't believe we can change our mind. We don't even think that's an option when suffering is so bad. Someone else? Yes, sweetheart. Yes, you had your hand up, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Be closer to the mic, sweetheart. Okay. I have a question. Maybe I'm going to repeat um, some of the questions, but when you feel the fear of, for example, I do some project, right? And I'm feeling the fear of what if it's not going to succeed? Exactly. Absolutely. So when I feel it, and I feel an anxiety, exactly. and I feel stress, and then, you know, all these other feelings. Yes, exactly. So 
How can I um, control my mind? I understand, darling. Of course, <laughs> this is such a common one, isn't it? It's so, I mean, this isn't enough. I mean, literally, it's such a common one, yeah. I mean, this is why I always it's, in, it's helpful to do an analysis of it first. I'm just trying to use an analysis of it, using this Buddhist view. We can analyze what's going on. So the analysis is this. So then, like his question, that's all very fine. Many now tell me how to do it. So we do the analysis first. So why? So what anxiety quite literally is in this case is because of intense attachment. Okay, again, this is my point to Olga. There's, there's, there's positive, reasonable states of mind. So in this case, you've got a job, you've got a project, you've got to get it done. You need to get it approved of so you can move forward. You've got, to, you've got to drive the car. You've got to get from A to B. You've got to go to the shop and buy the food. You've got to cook the meal. Every day you've got jobs and tasks that are part of our life. That you could say is a valid thing. But where the trouble is, is where the attachment gets on top of it and pollutes it and poisons it. So if you didn't have attachment, which is this bottomless pit of, 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 a, of feeling I'm not enough, when you've got strong sense of this attachment at this very deep level of I'm somehow not enough and I, I haven't done enough and I'm not good enough, this can be overwhelming and can destroy, even if you do a good project, you should be delighted with yourself and be confident because it is correct, but the anxiety, which is attachment, oh, it's not good enough. Oh my God, I won't be succeeding. Oh my God, they won't like me. Oh my God, I'm no good. And you collapse. So it's because of attachment, but it's really hard to distinguish between the attachment to succeed and the valid, reasonable necessity to succeed. We can't see the difference. You see what I'm trying to say? So we have to continue to do your job, continue to be, and you've got to be, so we can see you've got to be reasonable. You know yourself when you, you're really unhappy about something, we think we are the worst person on the planet. And you, you, you go and tell your friend, I'm so bad, I'm completely hopeless and she hates me and the boss thinks I'm terrible. Oh my God, I'm going to lose the job. And they'll say, would you be quiet? You're doing really well and you tick all the boxes. You did a good job. Look at this thing you just did. It's beautiful. You did the right thing. You've done all this. It's all correct. But we can't see it. We're overwhelmed by the unhappy view, the distressing view, which exaggerates our badness. The delusions by definition exaggerate and distort and somehow see the worst, you know. That's the irony of ego. So it's, re it's really hard to see the difference. Do you understand? I mean, it's sort of like even just driving a car. If, you're conf if you know how to drive a car, you can't, I mean, it's, it's correct to be anxious if you get on the freeway at 100 miles an hour and don't know how to drive a car. You, you will be anxious and you're going to kill yourself. So if you do know how to drive a car, then, and you are confident that you know how to drive the car, and you're confident to know how to handle the traffic, then you will do a good job. But as soon as the anxiety comes, oh, I can't drive a car properly, oh my God, what if I crash, what if this happens? You can't even move one inch. And that sometimes is what paralyzes us, you know. So you have to not, be ex not go, oh yeah, I'm going to be perfect on the road, and then you crash, because you don't know how to drive. You don't lie to yourself. So be reasonable, do the thing properly, and then attempt to argue with, you know, try to be reasonable, see the reality, not the distorted fantasy. It's very hard, but this is, do you see my point? And then the other one is, because you might fail. Excuse me, join the universe. So be prepared to fail and know that's okay. You can pick yourself up and just keep moving. That's a big one, because if we have masses of attachment for everything only to be perfect, you know things can't be perfect. Or if it is perfect, it can change. So if we live in total fear of bad things happening, we can't even move an inch. So be prepared for bad things to happen, not in a, not in a depressed way, just in a, a natural knowing that things are, this is the way life goes. Then you won't be afraid of it. So if you get sacked and you don't pass, people think your project is lousy, you pick yourself up and you keep moving. Do you understand? Do you understand, darling? Just keep at it every day. It takes enormous practice. It's one step at a time, you know. But then we have, we have to use practical techniques to help us, you know. 
Um, thank like, you. Just a sec. Just one, oh, sec one second. One second. So even just practical things like you know when you when you're anxious, you know your breath is tight. You feel like you want to explode. So have practical exercises like breathing exercises, like do your yoga or something. That because the body and the mind are very intimately connected. So do things like deep breathing can immediately calm your mind down. We can use practical techniques as well to help us deal with our problems. You understand? Body and mind. Eat properly. Have some sleep. Do you understand? It helps. Do you understand? Yes. Talk. Yes, Rita. Um. Thank you. I, I enjoyed the um, the epistemology you gave, like the, okay. the eye consciousness that sees yes. shapes yeah. and colors. Yes. Um, and but I'm interested in aesthetics, like beauty and ugliness. There's no beauty or ugliness. No, that's not, in uh, the no world. I understand that. I understand. But what was the word you said? Yeah. I'm interested in what you said. The word was sex. You said. Oh uh, yeah, I'm interested like in, in aesthetics, like beauty. Oh, and aesthetics. Ugliness. No, I hear you. I totally hear you. This also is very fascinating. Okay, let's look more carefully at it. It's really interesting, isn't it? No. First of all, we know, as our mothers told us, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We just know that, don't we? Listen to that. That's exactly what Buddha is saying. In one sense, we all know that beauty is in... Did, you not, did your mother not teach you that? You've heard that, haven't you? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, which is all Buddha is saying. And we all know that, you know, it can be a person who even is convinced. I mean, okay, okay, okay. First of all, there's colour and shape. Just bare bones, colour and shape. So then we say, oh, there's a beautiful cup. There's a nice something. There's a nice design. There's, you know, Mac is a, more, a better design than another one. So, we, so but when we say that, there can still be some conventional truth to that. Let's say you're, 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 you're competing in a chocolate cake um, event. You can still argue there are a series of rules that govern what's the best chocolate cake. You can still say that. It's not, it's not as if it's totally wrong. But attachment just exaggerates, even if there's no validity there. Do you understand? So it doesn't mean you're throwing out aesthetics. Even as it doesn't mean you're throwing out some conventional reality. But it also, that's very, it's very, um, it's very, it's very contextual. I mean, I was just looking recently at, uh, at uh, a, a, a documentary on Jean, Jean, what's his name? Basquiat. Jean, what's his name? Jean something. Jean Michel. Basquiat. So clearly, if he was painting like, he was drawing like that in, in the 1600s, they would have locked him up in an insane asylum. Do you get my point here? So that would not be considered good art, but there he is selling for $100 million. I mean, the man's dead, so it doesn't help him. So we can, it's, we can really see it's very much contextual, what's considered. For example, I, I had this, somebody gave me this um, Turkish rug, right? A traditional Turkish rug. And I asked my friend who's Turkish in Santa Fe to come and look at it and value it, because I wanted to sell it and get rid of it, because somebody gave it to me. And as soon as he saw it, he said, oh, no, that's not popular these days. You won't get anything for that, because people now like modern Turkish rugs. So you can see it's very conventional, what's considered to be good. But even your own personal taste can change. So it's not as if that's completely invalid. But um, so what to say? You could still argue the cake you made did win the blue ribbon in the cake contest because you did pass all the points. You ticked all the boxes for the best chocolate cake. But still, it's an opinion because if someone has an allergy and will vomit when they eat chocolate cake, they will never, ever, ever, ever see a nice chocolate cake. So it's not as if it throws the baby out with the bathwater, but it can be very sobering when we realise we're living in these opinions because the real problem is we believe... This is, see, the real problem is not so much that there can be some valid, valid statements in aesthetics, but our problem is because attachment is exaggerating the beauty of something that we are attached to, we don't think. We think it is that objectively. In other words, you are attached to the chocolate cake. And it's, when you're attached to chocolate cake, you don't just see it as more delicious than it is. You believe that deliciousness is a component that you put in the cake along with the flour and the sugar and the coffee and the, and the chocolate. You think it's objectively, and then you criticize everybody else who doesn't like it. So that's where we can see it becomes fundamentalist. You're right, I'm wrong. So it's not as if you can't be nuanced and have aesthetics. It's this fundamentalism of not only believing it's more delicious than it is, but believing it's in the cake itself. 
You get my point here. It's, it's much more powerful than that. And realise that we believe our opinions. I never think for one second that that, you know, that red cup is um, I, I would never say, well, I think it's a very appealing cup. I will say it is a nice cup. That's the problem of it. That's the problem, the fundamentalism. I'm right and you're wrong. That's the problem. Do you get my point? Good, yeah. That's the real point. That's the point. It's not a question of just, oh, you not have any taste, you know, or give up any opinion. You become like a moron. That's not what's not being said. You're just seeing the way the mind functions, you know. What else, people? Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi, good evening. Hello, um, sweetheart. Hi. Um, so uh, I was reading a little bit about um, Buddhism before I came to okay, you. Okay. And um, I know that the concept of overcoming attachment is bodhicitta. And you, you say it again, sweetheart. What do you say? You know so, what? Um, so I've read that the concept of overcoming attachment yeah. is bodhicitta. Okay, then. And um, I don't know if I'm saying that right. But, don't worry, darling, that's good. Um, it's the trickiest area for me. The who? It's it's the trickiest area for me. So Which like, piece? yeah, tell me more. Um, let's say um, somebody metaphorically throws a brick at you with the words that they use yes. because they're coming from their bad karma. That's exactly right. Yes. And they're hurting themselves more than they are hurting you. Absolutely. Um, and that's your opportunity to build your positive traits and gain your good karma. So I've been in situations like that because I'm a nursing professional and there's something called nurse bullying. It happens in on the job. It happens in medicine. And it's like conceptually it makes sense to me. It is very tricky and I'm wondering like, what three tools do you have? I understand, sweetheart. So I understand exactly. Okay. I understand. So there's this nice analogy in Buddhism that a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So bodhicitta is this ultimate level, a culmination of incredible compassion, incredible love, mm. incredible empathy. It's a more advanced level of practice. Mm. Do you understand me? And that's the compassion wing. And that's necessarily, interestingly, more advanced than the wisdom wing. So the wisdom wing is what we're talking about now. Knowing yourself, understanding your attachment, understanding your fears, understanding your anger, understanding your jealousy. Do you get my point? And beginning to train yourself in lessening those and becoming content and fulfilled in yourself and therefore more loving and compassionate so to help others. It's a gradual process. So if you are a nurse and you've got lots of attachment to be loved by everybody, do you understand my point now? You're needing to be approved of. Well, then if you're like that and then someone does this, what you just said, you will not be able to cope. It will destroy you because you're hungrily wanting to be seen as a good girl and then some person's mean like your new, the boss on the, on the, on the shift or is mean to you, you'll collapse and you, you'll have to leave the job. So the wisdom wing is really the first one. Put yourself together, understand attachment, understand your own neediness, get beyond that, become more fulfilled and content and confident in yourself. Then you can afford to be wise in relation to what you just said about the person harming themselves more. But if you are at the more fragile level, you can't, you have to leave that job. You have to leave that person. You can't cope with it. You've got to know what you're capable of. So, what three tools can I use to build that? Well, so we're discussing here, like I said to the gentleman with the glasses, who answer his question. This is the beginning of Buddhist practice. No, learning to get a, a, a practice every day, learning to know your own mind, developing some kind of focus, being aware of what you're thinking and feeling moment by moment, which is very hard, and learning to adjust it. It's really quite a subtle job, distinguishing between attachment and, and kindness, for example. I mean, you know, we've all got attachment, the Buddha says, and until we're highly advanced, we're going to have it. So it's really... I mean, even just to say the bodhicitta is the opposite of attachment. I don't know where you read that. That sounds like a classic Tibetan Buddhist, a classic Tibetan Lama's presentation of the perfect teachings. But it's so advanced. Mm. So that's what practice is. That's what Buddhist practice is: knowing your mind well first, having a daily practice, being a careful, controlling your body, controlling your speech, watching things, being cautious, di disciplining yourself, learning your practice, and then on the basis of this, you become more content and then you're able to be more wise and more skillful and more compassionate with others. Thank you. You, you understand? It's quite advanced, actually. Mm. Compassion wing is really quite advanced. And saying, I mean, where would you get those words from, that body cheat is the opposite to attachment? 
Um, well, there's a book. Um, Which called, book is it? it it's called uh, Buddha and the Borderline. Who? Buddha and who? <laughs> Buddha and the Borderline. Who wrote it? Uh, a girl with borderline personality disorder. Huh? What do you? And basically, she healed herself through Buddhism. And anyway, I'm interested in psychiatry, so that's why I read it. I understand. Okay. Yeah. But are we communicating? Did you hear what I said? Is it answering your questions or not? Um, I'm going to process it, and if I still have a question, I'll ask yeah, you afterwards. Yeah, please. So the general yeah. Buddhist approach, and we often initially don't see it like that, because one of the things that attracts people to Buddhism is people want to be kind and loving, and things all about having to develop love and compassion. And if you hear the Dalai Lama talk all the time, it's all he's talking, all he talks about is love and compassion, mm. which is a, at least a reasonable approach in life, try to be nice to people and not be mean. But the whole Buddhist approach is you've got to know, your, the wisdom wing is knowing your own mind really well and controlling your body and controlling your speech and having discipline so you can put yourself together. Because you can't lift a finger to help others or be wise in understanding others if you don't understand yourself. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Mm. You get my point? Yep. So one step at a time, honey. If you like what you're reading, get a good practice and go from there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good, darling. What else, people? Somebody up here. Who is that? Mukund. Talk to me, Mukund. Sweetheart. Uh, yes. Um, hello, Venerable. Um, hello. Sorry, my camera is not working for some reason. Uh, the three things I'll try to be brief. First of all, thank you so much for what you do. Uh, you know, thank you for your life's work. I mean, it's uh, uh, you add something special and different from all the masters on the internet, and <laughs> and it, it's 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 a wonderful flavor you add. So uh, deeply, thank you. I'm a better father, and my kids will have a better life. So, and I really mean that. It's it really makes a big difference. Uh, uh, sorry, for some reason, I'm having audio issues as well, but that's okay. Um, um, uh, I, 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 this is a fascinating uh, discussion, and in my, uh, just one observation and then one question, I find that in addressing defilements, the biggest challenge I have is just to see it. You know, if I can see fierce, sorry, venerable, I'm having an audio issue. Maybe I'll just mute and come back. I'm, I'm, I'm... Go on, For man. some reason, I'm not able to. Okay, I can hear you now. I can hear you. Good, sir. You know. I'm yeah. a, a trouble addressing what? Uh, no, no, I've noticed, uh, my observation is that uh, when it comes to addressing any defilement, the okay. challenge is to really just see it very, very clearly. Yes. If I see it clearly, it's gone. Um, and uh, and sometimes, like, you know, for me, I realized that anger I had to work on for years. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but I could still see it come up. Fear was in my bones. It's like, you know, yes. I can't even see that I'm acting out of fear. My question is actually, I, I find fear is underpinning all of them at a quite a subtle level. I, I guess that's why. I guess that's why it was so hard to see for such a long time, because you don't even see it come up, and you you realize, oh, it actually was, you know, twenty blocks also, down Mukund, the road. Also, if you really look carefully, if you see anger coming, look at it. I mean, yes. you look at your child who suddenly gets angry. Why is because their attachment was sitting there. They don't notice it. We all don't notice our attachment. Every second is only wanting everything to be nice. So the second your son gets hurt by your his brother, then his attachment just didn't get what it wanted. So he gets angry, but he's having a panic attack. That is an expression of fear. Oh, my God, look at this, what you did to me. My daddy, daddy, look what he did to me. He's having an anxiety attack. If anger, attachment, jealousy are rooted in fear. Their flavor is fear. Fear. There is a fear of ego grasping, the root delusion, Mukund, that's different. That's the primordial fear, the one that they talk about of instinct for survival when you're driving the car and someone nearly crashes into you and this instantaneous feeling of I rises. That's the primordial fear for sure. So, of course, it's hard to see, but this is to hear that fear is the character of all of them. And when you realize emptiness and cut ego, there will be no fear. Your mind will be blissful. This is hard to even imagine, but slowly, slowly. Yeah. Uh, 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 Venerable, my question is on a, on a different point, actually. Okay. I find, you know, subtle attachment to food, you know, 
late at night, tired, hungry, not, not hungry, sorry, tired, exhausted after the day. You know, yeah. I feel like, oh, I'm, I'm entitled to indulge a bit. And I know no, I it's not good. <laughs> yes. I mean, the thing uh, is, okay, listen, this is, keep going. Go on, ask the question. Go. And the point is, you know, I, I feel that, you know, at each defilement, you've got to address it differently. And right now, I'm still grappling with this. I mean, how do listen I address okay, subtle talk. attachments? Okay listen. okay, listen. The thing is, when we start to practice and then we think earnestly and with sincerity, I want to give up attachment. And of course, we can see one of our obvious attachments is food. I mean, join the universe, you know. So then naturally, what happens is we get over strict with ourselves. We get over strict with ourselves. We get a bit kind of, we get a bit sort of like fundamentalist. Oh, I shouldn't eat too much food. Oh, I'm, if I've got, I'm eating too much food or I'm getting attached. We can be a bit, we can be a bit like a policeman with ourselves. So, you know, it, you could say that if you're catching your mind, you come home, you're exhausted. And then, of course, you want some satisfaction. So then, you, I mean, if you're really being sincere in your practice and you check up, well, do I really need the food? Maybe, you know, you don't really need it. But if you really want to, and you want, it will relax you to go and get a nice piece of toast or whatever it is you'd like or whatever it is. And then don't be a policeman with yourself. And if you have a practice and then you can offer it, you do a practice of offering your food and things like that. Um, it was much easier when I was in India. I'm not anymore. So, but oh, okay. yeah, not so much anymore. Then you make it a practice. I mean, it depends on you know. If you're a junkie for food, no, you try to be disciplined. But so it's a question of not being like a policeman. But see, this is when you say I, I'm entitled. That's a bit the way ego is a bit childish, and we want to be given permission to do something, which is a very strong feeling in spiritual practice. But we don't need to be having permission from anybody. We are the boss. So you make it where you make a wise decision because you are in control. You are the boss. You don't need to be given permission by anybody. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes. Yes. Because, I mean, of course it's attachment. I mean, you know, you're, you're tired and you're hungry. You're, it's not hungry, I agree. But make it so you can make it a practice if you want to. It's not set in stone. I mean, if you've got the Mahayana approach and you've maybe got vows, I don't know, you haven't said, then you can turn it into a practice. It doesn't have to be naughty. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. Yes, yes, I do. I mean, I you do. know, for example, you know, like, you know, one of my friends one time in the Zoom, one of the Zoom teaching, she said, oh, I get so lazy, I want to put my feet up and watch Zoom all day. Or Zoom sometimes, oh, I feel guilty, I shouldn't be watching Zoom, I'm just lazy, I should do this. And I said, I understand. And I said, have you got body suffer vows? And she said, yes. I said, well, then, you know, be a grown up with yourself and you can watch Netflix with Body Cheetah. You can decide, okay, I'm going to relax and I'm going to sit my feet up. I'm going to watch Netflix so I can be comfortable and be a better human being so I can be kind to others. You can do the same with your food. We don't have to be fundamentalist about it. You can make it a virtue by changing your motivation, Mukund. That is so fascinating. Thank you, you understand? So yes. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. Isn't it? What time is it? No clock. No clock. No clock. Ooh, ooh. Go on. What time is it? Almost eight, which is home time. So any more questions, people? Any more points to bring up? No? Don't have to be. Anything there? Nothing? All you darling people? It's enough then, maybe. I don't know. It goes quickly, doesn't it? So we just keep moving, keep moving, whatever makes sense. One percent of this, you take it and you start with it. Because everything I'm saying here, this is, you know, your point. Everything I'm saying here is coming from method, some very laid out, clear methodology. It's all there. The methodology is there, you know. That's what's kind of encouraging. And maybe just finish with um, another point, which is the first stage of practice. Your point back there, the nurse. Nursing, you said nurse, didn't you? Good, darling. And or anyone, anyone, any of us, any of us. This is huge practice, and there's no time to get onto it now. But we can do this another day. Um, you know, the very first level of practice in Buddhism, actually, entry level, junior school, grade one, isn't to watch your mind. No, it's to control the servants of your mind, your speech, and your uncontrolled physical behaviour. 
It's all about behavior. That's what vows are about, precepts. You discipline your behavior. So we know that. If you're going to you know, learn to internalize musical theory, and I mean it, we don't think this way, but it's true. How can you, and then, you know, you have to train your fingers in endless, endless arpeggios and scales and arpeggios and scales and exercises to get your fingers anywhere near capable of playing that genius music. So everything is to do with the body and the speech first. Everything is to do with the body and speech, but they're the servants of our mind. So here we're trying to turn ourselves into not a musician or a cook, into a marvellous, happy, fulfilled, content, wise, compassionate human being. Start with your body and speech. 99% of our problems will disappear in our relationships if we can control our speech. And that's a very specific practice. So you're using your mind to control your speech. At least then you can avoid so many of your problems in the work, in the work, in the workplace and at home, you know. There's a huge practice. No time to talk now. We'll discuss that another day. So that'll do. I'll just sing a little prayer. Jang Chob, Sem Chob, Rinpo Che, Ma Khe Panam, Khe Gu Chi, Khe Pa Nyam Pa, Me Pa Yang Gong Ne Gong Du Pa Wa Cho, Ghe Wa Di, Nyu Du Da Gra Ma Sang Ghe Drup Gyo Ne, Dro Wa Chi Kyang, Ma Lu Pa, De Isa La Gu Pa Shog. And then may His Holiness Dalai Lama live a long, 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 long life. Keep promising he's going to live for 20, 30 more years. So let's hope he does and hang on to his coattails. And may we all live a long life so we can, we can be useful on this planet. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, people. Much love. Thank you, sweetheart.